So greetings from London, a sunny day, as you can see. Welcome to my living room and to our session. I hope no one rings the bell, it has happened before. Um, uh, what a morning, I've learned so much, like I was saying, it is such an honor to be hosting this panel and to be able to add to, to the discussion. Um, the name of the session, as you know, is the changing role of the tourism authority in root um, development. So much to discuss. Um, there's a clear disconnect, as John was saying, between the two um, in many cases, and destinations across the globe need to work closer to the airlines themselves to increase um, air connectivity in order to revive the sector. So we're looking forward to hearing from our guests and to have them share their thoughts on how this um, challenge can be overcome. Um, let's see if we can leave this session with some practical steps both airlines and tourism boards can take to improve um, this engagement with, uh, with airlines. Before we start our discussion, we want to run a quick poll, uh, which you will have around 45 seconds to vote on. Let me see, are we ready for the poll? I, yeah, here we go. So the question is, do you think we will see more tourism authority engagement in aviation development through air access committees or similar initiatives? And the options are, yes, destinations now understand the importance of air connectivity. No, uh, destinations will continue to leave it to the airport operators to some extent. Uh, oh, uh, to, to the airport operators. And third option, to some extent, only the most proactive destinations will adopt this approach. Voting is now open and you'll have around 45 seconds to vote. And while you do, I wanted to salute the many French speakers that we have in the audience. Um, it would have been a pleasure to be with you in, on the ground in Madagascar, but bonjour and of course, salama. And let's see if the results are in. They are in, and the winner is, to some extent, only the most proactive destinations will adopt this approach. Well, um, I think that now you should be able to see the results on your screen, really interesting. This should set the ground for an interesting discussion. And um, if we have time, we will take um, a few questions from the audience um, in, in the chat. So without further ado, let me introduce you our guests, two legends um, of the industry in their own right. We have Carol, Carol Hay, who is our All Things Caribbean guru and is the founder and uh, CEO of Mackenzie Gale Limited, a global tourism marketing and development agency. Carol was until very recently the director of marketing for the UK and Europe for the Caribbean Tourism Organization where she served for 10 years. I mean, she really is a guru. And prior to that, she held a variety of senior roles at the Jamaica Tourism Board and other tourism related organizations. Also with us, we have the Honorable Minister Najib Balala, Cabinet Secretary for Tourism and Wildlife for the Republic of Kenya, a role that he's been in for the past three years. And prior to that, he served as Minister of Tourism of Kenya for eight years. So as you can see, we really have two industry legends with us today. And thank you again for joining us. Carol, welcome once again. How are you? It's, it's so good to have you with us. And I believe that like me, you're in London. Yes, good morning. Um, oh yes, it's still morning. I'm very well, thank you. And amazed because you're right, the sun is shining. It's a lovely day in London. So we don't have to be too envious of the minister and everyone else who I'm sure is enjoying much better weather than we are. But we live in hope that as you say, eventually we can return to the shores of Africa, the Caribbean and all the other places that we want to go to. But yes, I'm good. Thank you. Um, Back to um, our, um, our panel discussion. Uh, I know we really cannot generalize as the Caribbean includes 24 island countries, but you worked with the Caribbean for so many years and back when you did, and I believe you still work with them now, but back then, how did you work with airports and airlines? Um, it would be great if you could share with us some of the experience that you gained um, attracting airlines to work with you. I'd imagine most visitors arrive by air, obviously. Yes, and you know what, your, your, your poll um, was quite an amusing poll for me because I, I wanted to press and say, yes, 
everyone does this, but I knew that within my heart, I, I couldn't press. So I actually had to, was one of those who said to some extent, because when I look back at my career in tourism and all the work that I've done with the destinations and aviation, I thought, my goodness, she's right. We really didn't speak a lot to the airports. I certainly didn't. Now that to an extent could be that I will, I, I, I'm based in the UK and have been for, for most of my life. So maybe my colleagues based in the Caribbean had more engagement with the airports. And, in, and I should be honest to say that the, air, the airports that were the most proactive were the ones that were either being divested or the ones that had been upgraded and they had opened new airports and they knew the cost to the country to open up a new airport. And therefore it was important to ensure that that airport was viable. So there are some key indicators as to why um, there would be greater engagement with airports than others. And I think to a, a larger extent, it really depended on the type of airport it was. Now in the Caribbean, we actually have, um, you mentioned 24 countries, but those are probably the primary ones, but there are many more countries in the Caribbean. And there are some um, countries that have many uh, outer islands as well. So the potential for airports, whether they're large or small is massive, but you're right. And the poll has also shown that there is a massive gap with how we engage with airports. Now with airlines, it was a totally different relationship. And certainly for my role, you know, representing um, the Caribbean across UK, Europe, Middle East, Africa, we worked very closely with <clears throat> the airlines. And on two levels, I should add, one, yes, is the traditional tourism market, but also for us, there's a very strong diaspora market. And therefore we found that the airlines, particularly those that target um, some of the more popular destinations, really worked closely with us in also speaking to the diaspora market because they are aware that at certain times it is the diaspora that's going to travel home. So we found that those, the wiser airlines have also focused, let's say looking at the Caribbean, we have a lot of um, English speaking destinations. So of course, that you'll find that there's good airlift between the UK and the Caribbean. The same, can, the same can be said for France and the French speaking Caribbean, for the Netherlands and the Dutch speaking Caribbean. So we've realized that in building that relationship and also because of seasonality, which keeps destinations going, you can't all, always focus just on what we call the bucket and spade market, but also those who go home because of culture, heritage, occasions. So um, the relationship with airlines has been really good for the Caribbean. And I suppose as our discussion goes on, we'll also address some of the challenges, what we can do better, but the gap is with the airport. And I think that's a, that's a key area to address. Thank you, Karen, um, go for it. Tell us, what, what, what were the main challenges for you? Um, share, share with us, let's be honest. Well, I think looking back and I've experienced that the main challenge is money. And I'm gonna tell you why. When a destination attracts an airline, there, there is, ah, oh, the balloons are going, you have the fire engines there, the, you know, the water display. But what we don't always focus on is, how are we going to sustain this? And I have therefore seen after great welcome and recognition, three months, six months later, you hear that that route has ended, unable to continue it. And when you do your investigations, a lot of it is based on the marketing. Attracting an airline to a destination is one thing, but continually ensuring that every single flight is filled on both the outbound and the return leg takes a lot of work, a lot of money and a lot of investment. And that's why collaboration is key. And when you're attracting airlines, even though our role is in tourism, we have to think outside of tourism. We have to ask ourselves, what is the investment promotion agency doing? 
There's absolutely no point in the investment promotion agency being out there and speaking to investors in one market and the destination team, the other side of the world, looking at attracting another market. There has to be synergy. We also need to find out what the Chamber of Commerce are doing, what's their focus, and the other business entities, the export agency, also the knowledge industry, the universities, who are they targeting, who are they going after to fill their university programs, the health sector, the finance sector. So when we look at rude collaboration, tourism shouldn't sit down in an office and say, great, how are we gonna go about it? Stake, stakeholder engagement is one of the key pillars of sustaining anything in tourism, including airlift. And if we don't bring in all the other players, and I think COVID has taught us that when we can't rely on tourism, international tourism, to fill our flights, to fill our hotels, to eat in our restaurants. What can we do within our region? What can we do within our communities? How can we speak to the other pillars of industry and say, how can you help us? Can we look more at cargo? Can we look more at some of the other sectors? So that's why collaboration is key. And also another challenge as well, is with is the whole relationship with the airports. It's so important to bring them on board. I remember recently I was listening to the news um, in London, um, and and um, one of our local airports, not Gatwick or Heathrow, but one of the more provincial ones, said that you know if tourism doesn't return, this airport is going to close. And I was like, what? Never in my lifetime did I think I would sit and hear that we're actually talking about closing airports. What will be the impact on that community, the hotels, the restaurants, the taxi service, and all the other services there? So that is why we have to have stronger collaboration between the airports, the destinations, the airlines, the business community, knowledge, health, we really are in this together. And if one thing COVID has taught us, we cannot do this alone. And as we now start to reposition and look at our plans for the next 10, 15, 20 years, each and every one of us here today needs to ensure that whatever role we play, we're the ones to say, you know, this is a great discussion. We're going to take it forward, but we don't want four, six or 10 of us around the table. We want to ensure that every single sector that has reason at some time to go to an airport is around the discussion table because they're gonna help us attract airlift, ensure our airports are ready and come up with the funds to sustain the entire program. And those are just my few opening comments on the whole subject. I love it, uh, I love it. It's this unified approach that's, that the industry needs to work, to, to work towards. And impact on the community, I mean, devastating no words um uh, but let's focus on restarting and restarting yeah. better right absolutely um, minister balala welcome and thank you for joining us too always a pleasure to see you i think last time that i saw you was in saint petersburg my god almost two years ago um how are you and how is kenya doing in this in this difficult time well, uh, Mafalda, thank you very much. And nice to see you again. Uh, yes, St. Peter's back during the UNWTO uh, General Assembly. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, John has invited me uh, on this uh, Aviadev uh, forums and it's exciting. And every day I learn something new, particularly when I join these aviation forums. I've never been an aviation person. But uh, I'm excited to hear what Lyft is saying, Jonathan, uh, and also what Carol is saying, the, the synergies between tourism and aviation. Uh, first of all, uh, Kenya is, uh, like any other country, suffered uh, on tourism. Maybe other industries are flourishing. For example, our agricultural industry is doing very well. Our flower business is booming. 
but tourism is down. Uh, so tourism is really hit, not only in Kenya, all over the world. Uh, and still, uh, we, are not, we are not yet there. Uh, Kenya is open for tourism. Uh, yes, as far as you have a PCR, uh, we are struggling. We want everybody to, 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 to be in business. One, one thing what Carol said, if there's one thing that this pandemic has taught us is about tourism is not just a flowery sector or uh, something just for fun. Tourism is a livelihood. Tourism is an economy that touches everybody. It's livelihood for everybody. Even the lady who does the milk in the rural areas sells to tourism. So yes, I think it's one lesson we have learned. Tourism is an economy and really a big, big, big player in the economy. So, so collaboration is very important. Sometimes you think probably tourism should be under the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Economy or Ministry of Economy. But also I'm scared to say, yes, let it be there. When you put it under a large organization, tourism disappears. The focus will be the other vibrant industries, like for example, uh, industrializations would be better, or others trading, yeah, or, 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 or petroleum or chemical industries, yeah, tourism might disappear. That is the worry that I have, that if you merge it to a big organization, for example, we cannot do, we cannot promote destinations without connectivity. And I sympathize with the Caribbean because if you don't have connectivity, you have no tourism. Yeah. And, and I went, I was in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, and, and, and to connect from Jamaica to Barbados needed 18 hours. So I go to, to Miami to connect to Barbados. So you can see the value of connectivity that we need connectivity. And this is where the problem is. And that's why whenever uh, John invites me for this forum. I'm excited. I'm, although I am a tourism person, I'm not an aviation person. Uh, that Africa, we have 1.3 billion people, continent of Africa, and the connectivity is minimal. Is only to essential, probably only to capitals. And and I was very excited to hear what what Jonathan from Lyft is doing. He's pushing pushing the boundaries on the aviation sector. This part is difficult, but pushing the boundaries and creating innovation in the innovation. And we need in Africa connectivity. For example, here, despite the pandemic, if for the example, Europe is closed for Africa, we can do it to our neighbors uh, because we know how to address each other on the issue of securities and the issues of perception uh, and many other things. Connectivity is lacking the continent of Africa. And that's why uh, I think this is an opportunity for Africa to reflect. And yes, uh, Kenya has suffered during the pandemic, but what have we done? What we have done is this is the time for rethinking, remodeling, reimagining destinations. Uh, and, 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 and we are going to launch our re, rethinking strategy in the next one month and say, what do we want to achieve? Because people will not come because of hotel rooms. Tourism is not about just hotels. Tourism is about experiences. They want to connect with local communities. They want to feel their footprint is positive. That is tourism. It's only now people are waking up and saying, wow, I didn't realize if I'm not active in the social media, I am out of business. Technology is another thing. How do we make sure we invest heavily in technology? And then appreciating there's a market next door to you or outside your door, the domestic market, what we have ignored. Yeah, and, and these are the things that we have woken up and said, we cannot ignore these things. But yes, uh, it's a wake up call for us in Kenya. Uh, we, are, we are stressed about it. I hope the pandemic will finish faster, but every day you have hope, something happens. Uh, but we're not giving up. We're not giving up. We're not giving up. And uh, life is about hope. And uh, Mafalda, definitely. Uh, Kenya is there and strong and will be stronger. 
But I, I also cognizant that Kenya would not be stronger without its neighbors, without its region, without the continent, without the rest of the world. Because if, for example, we vaccinate the entire US population and US population wants to come to Kenya or to Africa and Africa is not vaccinated, there is a problem. The US is not safe. So the issue of being safe and feeling I am safe, you must appreciate your neighbor is also safe. So the vaccination rollout should be a global campaign and not an individual country and political opportunity for you to sell yourself to your citizens. No, it's about safety of, of, of the universe and all of us must be safe to be able to allow others to be safer as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Minister, leave, leave no one behind, um, right? And I was reading in the news this morning how um, the, the Prime Minister, how Boris Johnson has a plan to propose at the G7 meeting um, this, uh, over the next few days about how um, developed countries can help um, can help the, the, the countries that don't have enough uh, vaccines and just put a quick plan into action. Um, I mean, thank you for this. It, you highlighted where we wanted to get to, which is, you know, this, this increasing disconnectivity um, between destinations is going to be a key driver for, um, for, restarting, for restarting tourism. Um, Carol, is there any practical steps that, I mean, you, you know how these organizations and how these relationships work. Um, uh, is there some practical steps that you can give us for both um, airports and tourism boards to, to take to improve this, this much needed engagement and, this, and these corporations? I mean, yes, they need to speak to each other, but you know, how, how do you think this can be implemented? First of all, I always say to destinations, Bring your authentic self to the table. Don't pretend that your destination is what it is not. Whatever any destination has in the world, it's unique. It's who they are and it's what their tourism ingredients are. It's very important to do that. By bringing your authentic self to the table as a destination and knowing what you have to offer, it means that you will then have a clearer indication as to who you are targeting to your shores. Once you know who you're targeting or have an aware as to the potential target markets, you're then better able to determine who are the, or which carrier has the same type of vision the same type of focus and will work with you because it also speaks to the soul as to why they exist. We have luxury carriers, we have low cost carriers, we have carriers that are part of who want the whole visitor experience to be taken into account. Ta look at who you're working with, look at their reputation, how have they worked with other destinations, how have they supported them, what is their approach to sustainability, indigenous communities, community tourism, the impact, sustainability, all of these things now need to be taken into account when we're looking for partners to work with us. These relationships need to be built and strengthened. And if we go into short-term, six-term relationship, that just eats up the little money that many of our developing countries don't have. So we look at sustainable plans. We look at plans to grow, build and sustain our tourism that are based on partnerships. And it's also important to bring partners to the table that have a network of others that they can bring to support. And working with the Caribbean, one of the most important things I learned about airline negotiations, sometimes you need to go in there with others. Sometimes it's very difficult for some of our smaller destinations to go to sit around the negotiating table as one country with a population of 70,000 people. People joke to me that they've got schools bigger than that in some countries, but you know, you have populations of, of 20,000, 70,000, 150, 200,000, but it's difficult to go around the negotiating table. So sometimes I would say to countries, go together 
sit around that table and negotiate a double drop. So they will leave the UK, go to one destination, drop off, pick up, go to another one. Now I must say in a number of destinations in the Caribbean do that. But even for Africa and other parts of the world, sometimes you need to go together because it, you know, it, it costs real money to sustain airlines and, and also the marketing plan as well. Again, sit down with the airline and look at who you're targeting because who you're targeting will influence the, the, the target audiences, the markets that you're going to go after. When do they travel? What are they looking for? Does that coincide with the flight schedule that you're putting together? So, and another thing I always used to say, you know, and I still say, is don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Go into any negotiation and put on the table what it is that you want to lead that discussion with. I promise you two things, you'll either get it or you won't. If you get it, you're happy. If you don't, then you continue to negotiate, but know what you want for your country or your region and look at it in terms of years, not months. And, and then bring in the other partners. And I have found as well that sometimes, particularly when you're looking at marketing solutions, honestly, communication partners, technology partners, they're brilliant because no matter how the visitor says, oh, I want to um, digitally detox when I get there, they don't. We all need to stay in touch, particularly those of us who run businesses like myself. So, you know, bringing your communication partners, let them support you and talk about what it is that you have to offer. You can't do it alone as a destination. So you need the airport, you need all the agencies that I spoke about, but then you need to start thinking commercially as well and think, well, okay, who is the best partner? What it is, what is it that visitors want? What is it that, that, that the airline wants? And a final thing I'll add is that if you say to a lot of people, at your airport, who should the airline speak to if they want to advertise at your airport or if any of their partners want to advertise at your airport? It's amazing how many people do not know who is responsible for advertising at their airport, at their airport. And, and airlines actually need two-way traffic. They're bringing in lots of visitors, but they also want to work with communities where there is the potential for either the business or the national or, or the business um, community or the nationals to travel as well. So there's so many different elements. And another thing, one of the biggest um, issues that we've had to speak about so many times in the Caribbean, visa facilitation. I'm gonna say it again, visa facilitation. You can bring in all the airlines you want, but if you don't involve your Ministry of Foreign Affairs and ensure that we um, break down some of the barriers to travel. Now, of course, countries must protect their borders and they must know who is coming in and out, but there's a difference between protecting your borders and blocking tourism. So all of those elements need to be taken into account when you're speaking to the airlines. Think, as someone has said in the chat, think commercially. You know, there are so many times, and people get fed up with me when I say, wait, hold on a second. Tourism is a business. Yes, we love it. We're emotionally connected and it gives us wonderful memories. Tourism is a business. And certainly in the Caribbean, for a number of our destinations, tourism is the number one foreign exchange earner. It's a business, we need to treat it like a business and we need to manage it strategically, look at partnerships, both commercial and business and those that facilitate travel. And finally, let us also ensure that we bring in immigration and customs as well in the discussion. Because when you're out there attracting new markets and your customs and your immigration officer 
receives a passport in front of him and he knows nothing about that country, nothing about the entry, entry requirements. Sometimes it's not necessarily the best welcome for the visitor when they're escorted to a little room because no one has ever heard of that little island in the Caribbean or the Indian Ocean or the Pacific or where off the coast of Africa that they are from. And it has happened. So we do need to ensure that everyone is in the mix. So when we start attracting new, um, new markets and they're coming to our shores, we don't do everything so well and then spoil it at the port of entry because no one was expecting them and we escort them to a little room for 24 hours until we say welcome. By then they're already turned off. So many elements, but again, really emphasizes why collaboration is key, stakeholder engagement is key, and everyone involved in the tourism stakeholder value chain must sit around the table. Thank you. Thank you for this, Carol. Thank you for the prep talk. And I, I have to say that, uh, yes, you mentioned small uh, island countries, but I'm Portuguese. Have, I have a Portuguese passport and I was once taken into a room 20 years ago in Canada because at the border um, they weren't sure uh, if Portugal really was in Europe and that I didn't need a visa to come in. Um, but you, you heard her. Back to the table commercial, think commercial, and visa, visa facilitation, absolutely, huge key. Um, and, you know, I'm going to, the next question to, to close the session is back to Minister Balala, who's leading by example in so many of this. I mean, I know that I saw only a few days ago that you that you met with um, Qatar Airways, and I've accompanied you over the years as uh, Minister of Tourism, and you're doing so much in all of these areas that uh, that Carol spoke about. How could we uh, apply? And I think that we can apply a, a lot of the the steps that Carol mentioned to um, to Kenya and to Africa as a continent. Well, thank you very much. Again, is a uh, collaboration. Uh, first of all, for me, uh, why do airports be run by government? Because airports are destinations, are commercial destinations. It's a big shopping mall. Yeah, the gates are only exits. The the government gate where you need immigration and customs and stamps, those are exits. But the whole airport operation in today's world, you go and look at Heathrow. You go and look at Amsterdam, you go and look at Dubai, you go and look at Hong Kong or, or, or the Singaporean airport. Those are destinations by itself. It's not just about being stamped and walked in and walked out. Yeah, it's about shopping, it's about again restaurants, it's about everything. And for me, I see, I think we need to think out of the box and be courageous. And sometimes we say, oh, we lose jobs. No. The people who will be productive and the people who will smile at you when they stamp your, 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 your passport, those are the people who will get the jobs. The guys who are gloomy and ugly and, uh, and all those, they'll miss the jobs. And, and for me, I want us to think like that. Why are we fearing about doing things the right way? Probably we should be protective in terms of exploitation, but those are rules and regulations. And that is about competition. Yeah, but again, we must make it a destination that is attractive. And as Carol said, the point of entry is the airport. If the immigration officer, the custom officer harasses you there, you are done. You'll never come back again. And that's the agony of most of these destinations, long haul destinations suffer from. At least us in Kenya, you get visa at the airport or on arrival, or you just e-visa. Now this is e-visa. Within two minutes, you apply online and you get your visa and you're free to enter Kenya. And that is what we have improved. And most of countries in Africa has improved in terms of visa facilitation. Yeah, but again, we can do more. Now we are going to biometrics. You don't need a passport. Your face, again, those are, that's the technology we need. And that's why we need to invest into airports. So they are seamless. Connectivity, and that's why I say tourism is not, we need to look beyond tourism. If you don't have a proper road from the airport to your destination, to your hotel resort, you are doomed. 
you cannot come back. If it takes you three hours or two hours on a traffic jam from the airport to your hotel and your flight time is seven hours, you'll not go to that destination. So these are the things that is beyond, is beyond tourism. And, and yes, uh, as much as we say, probably we should not merge them together sometimes, but one thing you cannot avoid is tourism and aviation, they are intertwined, they are interlinked. Without the lift, there is no destination marketing. And, and I sympathize with, uh, with the Caribbean because they are far, they are island states, yeah? You cannot do border crossing, but you, okay, you have all the ships and the cruise liners coming in. But again, airlift is the most efficient and most important 50% of travel in the world is airlift, 50%. So how do we do that, airlift, uh, to, to make sure that connectivity is done? And then, yes, now tourism boards and tourism authority are engaging airlines. They know how to engage airlines. Probably they need to engage other, other stakeholders in the value chain, infrastructure, aviation, licensing, approvals, Again, airport efficiencies. During the pandemic, we are the ones in the tourism sector went to the airport authority to show them how do we make it compliant to the protocols? How do we do a, 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 a digital uh, PCR uh, certificates or, or verifications of certificates? Because that is crucial. We cannot use manual anymore. And that's why all our passports today are digital, that I can just scan it and within a minute I'll have all the information uh, on it. So that, that interlinked is crucial, is very crucial that we cannot avoid between tourism. And developing routes, developing routes, you need all stakeholders. You need all stakeholders, it doesn't matter which stakeholder, but you need all of them on the, on, on the table so that they know it's about the destination. It's not about a lodge or a safari or a beach resort. It's about the country. And I think one country that has done it very well of recent is Dubai. Emirates Airlines sells the destination Dubai. Okay, they, they, they are concerned because they are in business. They want to connect people throughout the world so they become an international hub. But first, they want you to come to Dubai and they'll make everything for you to Dubai, to stop in Dubai. And I see the figures. I mean, they have almost over 70 million people uh, through Dubai and almost 15 million stop in Dubai. So that is huge uh, tourism, tourism flow for Dubai. And it's a tiny little state. It's not even a, a, an island like Jamaica. It's, it's a tiny little state, but yes, everything is efficient. From the airport is efficient from the way the airline is efficient. I'm not here propagating and making a sales for Emirates, but I can tell you, we need airlines like that. We need people to think out of the box and be efficient and customer focused and say, yes, we need to make a difference. And we need to, to, to bring the two together, tourism and, 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 and aviation together. Thank you very much, my father. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today from, from Kenya and from London. I feel that we could continue this conversation and I, I hope that at some stage we can meet maybe even in person, which would be crazy, and, uh, and, and continue this. We will leave you, the audience, with some inspiring takeaways. Um, there are enough to get this conversation going. We have a lot of aviation industry executives and so many tourism board representatives, so get talking to each other. Follow these tips. If this was a, a in real life events, I mean, I couldn't wait for the coffee break to literally <laughs> grab everybody and just get everybody sitting at the table, like, like Carol said. This is this is our chance, and we we really need to be the the catalyzers to reignite the the tourism and aviation industry hand in hand. We we need to join forces together. We can we can restart and build back better and get back to that exponential growth that, that this industry is capable of and that was delivering pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I can't wait to, um, to see that happening and to see that chart going back up again. John, back to you in the studio and thank you again for, for having us. Merci. 
have to read this, Misa Otra Anau. Uh, good afternoon. And after watching the, the dancing video uh, at the airport, I, I cannot wait to come to Madagascar myself and meet the airport dancing staff. I mean, that's amazing. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you again.